Hello and welcome. It's been a week where the midnight oil was burnt in Britain and a late night session of the House of Lords where the controversial Rwanda bill finally passed two years since it was first proposed. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the plan to fly migrants to Africa will be the solution to what's become his mantra, stop the boats. We are ready, plans are in place and these flights will go come what may. No foreign court will stop us from getting flights off. It's been a week that's seen Portugal's president make an unexpected political comment. Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa saying his country should pay the costs of its historical involvement in slavery and colonialism. A rare instance of an EU leader backing the need for reparations, but it's not universally popular. We have to pay the costs. Are there actions that were not punished and those responsible were not arrested? Are there assets that were looted and not returned? Let's see how we can fix this. Third richest man, Elon Musk, locked horns with the Australian and Brazilian governments. The social media boss called an arrogant billionaire for refusing to remove violent content and hate speech. He claims free speech is under attack. Well, this guy is showing his arrogance. He's a billionaire uh, over there in the United States who thinks he's above Australian law. Welcome to the world this week. On Shakespeare's 460th birthday week, this week and the same week many years later, on the same day in fact, he also died. It's also the anniversary of Portugal's Carnation Revolution 50 years ago, which saw the end to dictatorship. Well, with me from the International Press Corps this week are Susanna Frexius, that's not her, I think that's Shakespeare, live from Brussels, <laughs> EU correspondent for Portuguese TV, Six Noticias, and columnist for Espresso newspaper. Good to see you, Susanna. Susanna, I want to talk about the latest piece you've been working on this week. This is in Espresso. You've been in Luxembourg. What's going on here? Hi, I, I was basically uh, covering the Foreign Affairs um, Council and it's interesting because, um, of course, uh, once again, the ministers were discussing the support to Ukraine, especially related to uh, air defence, but also once again discussing the Middle East uh, war. And, for instance, this time we had some protesters in front of the Council asking the EU to be tougher on Israel. Tougher on Israel. Susanna, we're going to come to you uh, later, talk a bit more in depth on that. Also with me in the studio, Isigal Sert, Turkish-American independent journalist and, well, pretty, um, pretty current right now, a uh, professor, renowned university, University of Political Science, Science Po. What are you making of what's going on there this week? I think it's a continuation of what has happened in, uh, during the Vietnam War, the 68 movement, uh, 20 years ago at some of the universities that are mentioned, like USC, NYU, which I attended, I was out um, uh, demonstrating against the war. So 20 years later, we have another war and another manifestation. But I guess we'll talk about it. We will. And the links to 1968, the, the anti-Vietnam protests as well. Also here, Craig Capetas, back by popular demand, contributing editor at Quartz, <laughs> also the Daily Beast. Craig, tell us about a story that's caught your eye, perhaps surprised you this week. Well, lock up your valuables. The International Olympic Committee gravy train is coming to Paris. I've covered eight Olympics. Brace yourselves, boys and girls. The torch handover to the French today. Not jaded by it at all, Craig? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and let's go live to Ghana, too. Let's bring in Patrick Smith. He is editor-in-chief of the quarterly magazine Africa Report. Uh, in fact, I'm told uh, he is trying to sort his technicals. We'll be with Patrick in just a moment. So, once more into the breach, let's have a look at some of today's issues. Starting with, well, the situation in the UK. Stop the boats, the current mantra of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. It has become his flagship policy ahead of the UK election this year. To put an end to clandestine migrant boats arriving illegally in southern England after setting off, usually at dawn from the northern French coast. The plan, two years in the making is not without controversy to send asylum seekers to Rwanda, paying the African government to house and deal with them 
On Monday this week, after months of legal political obstacles, there was a vote till you drop late night session in the House of Lords. Four rounds of voting, so called ping pong politics. Then this finally happened. They said the eyes have it. It went through. The Rwanda bill, now law, declared as a safe country and aims to ensure the scheme, which was ruled unlawful by the Supreme Court, is legally watertight, potentially now wave, paving the way for deportation flights to get off the ground. This was a delighted Rishi Sunak. This is one of the most complex operational endeavours the Home Office has carried out. But we are ready. Plans are in place. And these flights will go come what may. No foreign court will stop us from getting flights off. Rwanda is ready too. And I'd like to thank the government of Rwanda for their work in strengthening their asylum system, passing legislation and setting up a new appeals tribunal. Worth noting, hours after the bill was signed, news emerged of five migrants, including a child dying at sea in their attempt to cross. One of the right wing of the Conservative Party, Suella Bravman, saying that the Tory party will face oblivion at the election if this policy doesn't go through. Isigal, let's start with you. Is this potentially a success politically for Sunak or a gimmick? I think that's what he's aiming. He, he basically decided to follow what Boris Johnson started with this bill in 2022, which had its challenges, and he has become so obsessive in order to pass it, because timing in politics is everything. As you know, nobody does anything for just for the sake of doing it, for the kindness of their heart. The problem with this bill, so we have probably elections coming up in the UK in the fall, and and uh, Rishi Sunak knows very well that he's not very popular, um, and he's possibly party elections. We're still waiting him to set a date. He Absolutely. won't. Absolutely. But the thing is that what's going on right now in the UK with Rwanda reminds me a lot of what happened in my country in Turkey in 2015, 2016, with the European Union and the migrant um, deal in a way that Angela Merkel. Um, in a way, uh, uh, under Angela Merkel's uh, leadership, where just like Rwanda is getting a lot of money, Turkey did get a lot of money from the European Union in order to be the safeguard, or some, as some people would say, you know, the Europeans and, and the Brits don't want the migrants, so can you, third country, have, have us? And where we are today is that the European Union keeps giving money to Turkey and there are projects still, for instance, like education for these migrants that are not done. Mm -hmm. Security is another problem. So unfortunately, these are all bills when in the passage that you, you showed where Rishi Sunak thanks Rwanda, I'm sure that the Rwandan regime also uh, thanks him for all the money that he's getting. 350, potentially 370 million and by the end of the year. And he's going to get more in order to to bring these people to their own ground. And then is Rwanda really safe? Is that the right country to do that? I don't think so. And what about all the human rights violations that we are doing on with all this? Susanna, it's an interesting point Isigal raises. You and I back in 2015, we both reported on the emergence of the migration crisis from Turkey into the Greek islands, Bulgaria as well. Just what's your sense of how Rishi Sunak's plan is being seen by his European neighbours? Well, um, if you look at Ireland, I don't think Ireland is uh, happy. And uh, if you listen to what uh, Deputy Prime Minister said so far, um, actually, it seems that they fear that uh, all these migrants might end in Ireland uh, right now, so it's going to become a problem also uh, for Ireland. Uh, but, for instance, if you listen to what uh, Prime Minister, Italian Prime Minister Giorgio Milani said this week, uh, definitely she is in favour of this kind of agreements with uh, Rwanda. I'm not sure this is going to work uh, at the EU level. Uh, I mean, because uh, when we look at uh, what we have right now, we have a, a new pact, a new uh, migrant uh, and asylum pact. It's true that uh, it's not still um, totally uh, approved, so it was passed by the European Parliament, but the, it's, it is supposed to be passed also by the, 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 the member states in the, the next two weeks. But the, the main question is how it is going to be implemented. And it's true that if you look at the pact, the pact already foresees this concept of um, safe third country, but uh, you are not supposed, or the EU countries are not supposed to send asylum seekers to uh, safe uh, third countries. 
you can only send uh, people to uh, third countries when they are not eligible for asylum protection. So, for instance, if they arrive in, in, uh, in Europe, they are considered uh, economic migrants and then they will be returned either to uh, their uh, countries of origin or then to uh, third countries if, of course, there is a connection between this person and the third country. country. Of course, this is, um, it, this is not easy. Uh, there are a lot of criticism. Even the European Parliament, when they approved it, um, um, we have seen many, uh, we saw many MEPs saying, well, there are some problems here. But so far, this is not the Rwanda-style agreement. We have also seen what the EPP manifesto uh, said, and I think uh, you have mentioned it in a, um, in a previous um, uh, program, that uh, actually the EPP, so the center-right uh, family, is pushing forward for this outsourcing <coughs> of asylum uh, seeker requests. But uh, so far, I don't see it happening. Uh, but, of course, we cannot exclude that in the next term, uh, somehow the EU leaders will agree to something like that. Yes, yeah, really interesting, actually. You talk about the European um, People's Political Party, the Conservative, Social Le the Lion, the uh, President of the EU Commission, also sort of sensing that that could be a workable plan with an African third country, and certainly money with Georgia Maloney. They've gone to North African countries, Maloney, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, putting in money there to help with a, a policy of, of stopping migrant boats coming across. But let's have a listen yesterday to what President Macron had to say. It was a keynote speech but he made no sort of hidden agenda about his thoughts on Sunak's policy. I also do not believe in the model that is being proposed to us today, which consists of finding third countries on the African continent or elsewhere, where the idea would be to take back people who have come to our shores illegally and who do not come from the same countries. We are creating a geopolitics of cynicism that betrays our values and will create new dependencies. Craig, do you sense... As Susanna picked up there, mm -hmm. this split, the strength of the split within Europe about whether Sunak's policy actually would be a good move or not for other European countries. I, I often wonder if there's anything on the entire earth that's so unintelligent, so feckless, so, so unapt to perceive how the world really works than an upper-class Brexit politician. It, it, it makes you understand why back in the day the sun never set on the British Empire. God didn't trust them after dark, and this is yet another example of it. There was a, a, a wonderful item in the paper today uh, about, about uh, Congo, the DRC, which has been at war with Rwanda for, for many years. Uh, 1996, I think, or War 98, there's been one going on since 2002. And the question is, what if you have a migrant from, from the Congo, who shows up in the UK, they're going to send him to Rwanda, where he's probably, in all likelihood, if history is any indication, be, be thrown into a prison, tortured, <laughs> and, and roasted in a pot. Well, it's so, interesting. I saw the Conservatives, one of their senior ministers was asked this question yesterday. What really? happens if somebody comes from the DRC, goes to the UK? His view was there would be special exceptions. We would clearly look at that. So the caveat from the government is that we don't just put all people into a pot and send them. We do look through. But on that note, let's have a look at this YouGov poll. This is a, a British poll looking at support for the plan. If we can uh, give a sense of what it says. So here we go. Of all Britons asked, Labour Conservative support, 41%. Opposing it, 41%. Don't know. Then if we look about, uh, is this good value for money? It's quite different here. 50% saying, I think we'll see it in a moment, it's not. 16% saying it is. And the safety of the Rwanda plan as well, we can see here, uh, it's going too fast before me here, but basically, oh, value for money, 50% 50, 50 saying it's not, it is 16. So going back to what we said to you, uh, Isagal, we're talking about more than 350 million spent, not a single migrant arriving there yet. Rishi Sunak said it will come in the weeks ahead. You mentioned 2015, you mentioned Turkey. This is a problem, as politicians see it, that's been going on, well, go back 20 years for Calais, these crossings. 
I just wonder if whether you see the difficulty for the Conservative government to come up with anything else, given that a lot of the Conservative voters right now, it appears to be their number one issue ahead of the elections. Yes, uh, what Rishi Sunak said is 10 to 12 weeks, which comes to what, around July, the month of July. Um, what Craig said is, is very interesting because it's, 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 I fully agree, but it is so idealist and you're such an experienced journalist, you know on the field how it is that what these people, these politicians say and the reality yeah. is so far, far apart. The, the, I was uh, in, uh, at the uh, border with Syria and Turkey. I was at the border with Iran and Turkey. Um, people, are, no matter how many walls we keep building, be it between the U.S. and Mexico or in, or in the Middle East or in Africa, wh whatever bills we pass, there will always be, always be people who are going to try uh, to escape from a regime be it for economic uh, reasons, be it, be it for ecology, be it for, their, for human rights. And there will always be smugglers who are going to try to bring them, you know, to the other side in order to benefit from it, to benefit from the misfortune and make it his own fortune. So these politicians, by, by trying to pass these bills, whether it be it in Turkey, in the European Union, in the UK, or, or Rwanda, no, or in the US, um, no, matter, no matter where it is, it, it's, they are not thinking about the other. The whole moral value, the values that Emmanuel Macron mentioned in the clip that you passed is just words. Mm. Uh, but when you look at the actions, you see that those, those values are just for a few, and it comes with, the, with the, whatever stamp you have on your passport. Or it's not. a nauseous sham. Mm. You know, I mean, this is, this is pandering to the lowest common denom political denominator. Th thank you, Donald Trump. Uh, and it, it, it's not going to work, and, and they know it. We've seen this picture before. Well, according to the UN Special Rapporteur, the one obstacle ahead is even if the UK-Rwanda agreement goes ahead politically, airlines, aviation regulators could be complicit, quote, in violating international protection of human rights. So the question then becomes who will fly the planes and which carrier would want to take that on board? Um, yeah, I think there's still many questions around that. We haven't quite worked out a way whether we will see this happen at all. So, we go from the Rwanda bill, we're going to look elsewhere when we've got a situation uh, particularly uh, for Rishi Sunak to consider. We're also going to look at something that's close to Susanna Fretcher's heart at the moment, what's going on in Portugal. We've had a moment of an odd comment, an unexpected comment. This has come from the President uh, Marcelo in uh, Portugal, where he said that for all of the previous colonial crimes that were committed for the slave trade, that there should be repayment. Let's get a sense of what he was telling reporters on Tuesday night. It's not just apologising properly without a doubt for what we did, because apologising is sometimes the easiest thing to do. You apologise, turn your back and the job is done. No, it is taking responsibility for the future of what we did, good and bad, in the past. We have to pay the costs. Are there actions that were not punished and those responsible were not arrested? Are there assets that were looted and not returned? Let's see how we can fix this. So the president's offered an apology before, exactly a year ago, in fact. This was a step further than verbal contrition. Now, this is how the Portuguese newspaper Publico uh, covered it. They said, was President Marcelo's statement about colonial crimes late, they said, necessary or senseless? Espresso 2, Susanna's paper, say the president promises to see how we can repair the criminal actions in which those responsible were not arrested and return assets for those looted. Now, for historical context, Portugal has had a long involvement, the longest in any other European nation in the slave trade. Over four centuries, almost six million Africans trafficked from southern Europe to sub-Saharan Africa, then expanded to the Americas. Interestingly, the centre-right president hasn't always felt this way, analysts say, and opposition to this does come in the form of two other parties. Susanna, can you set this in context for us? How surprising it was, what he said. Well, first of all, um, it's important to have in mind that uh, the Portuguese president, he doesn't have executive powers, meaning, of course, he has other powers. Uh, politically, uh, he can put pressure 
on governments to move forward with debates, whatever, whatsoever. Uh, but we also have to, uh, it's important to have in mind that Marcelo is not, it's a, I would say he's a special president, meaning uh, he's very popular uh, in Portugal. Uh, quite often you can see him uh, uh, on the streets uh, taking selfies mm -hmm. with uh, people, with citizens. We call it Marcelfi, if you have a selfie with Marcelo. <laughs> is very... <laughs> So it's someone that is always uh, commenting, he, he, he's always talking, he's always uh, on TV. He can comment from politics to, to sports to football. So it's, it's not surprising that he says something like this, because probably this is how he thinks, uh, this is what he thinks about this specific topic. Uh, at the same time, it's a little bit surprising because he knows, Marcel knows, that this topic, it's not an easy topic. So uh, there is no consensus in Portugal to move forward with such a debate. Um, it's, it's not only the debate, it, there is no consensus to move forward uh, with the reparation. So um, I can understand that he was talking to uh, foreign correspondents. It was a dinner that lasts for four, four hours, which is something already quite incredible that uh, uh, you speak on the record with journalists for four hours. <laughs> We don't know if he, he of course, uh, it was on the record, but at some point, we, uh, we even the journalists, the Portuguese, Portuguese journalists, we are asking ourselves, was he aware that he was being recorded all, uh, all this time? And, of course, um, it's, he might have thought that it was popular to say these kind of things when he was talking to journalists from Mozambique, from Angola, from Brazil. But at the same time, he ignored that uh, it would create it would create a problem in, uh, internally. Um, and of course, uh, when we, we saw the reactions yesterday, uh, um, clearly the right-wing parties were not happy. And it's totally clear that this discussion, um, it's not going to be uh, an easy one. Just Bring us into a bit of context as well, Susanna, if you can. So this is something that, yeah, ahead of the European elections, I just wonder if this becomes an inadvertent issue because the far right, the Liberals, the Christian Democrats, am I right to say they're all against the idea of any reparations? Yes, and you also... Um... We had uh, recently had the elections in Portugal and you have, um, uh, in Parliament, you have a majority of right-wing parties. So even if the left will push for this kind of debate, uh, the right will not allow it. And for instance, it's true, the, the Christian Democrats and the Christian Democrats, part, uh, the, the, the CDS, so the Christian Democrats, they are part of the government. Uh, but also the Liberals, they are not in the government, uh, neither the far right, of course, they are against. But for instance, when you look uh, at the government position, they, the, the, the PS, uh, PSD, so the, the centre-right party, the main party in the government, they said nothing on the record uh, about this topic. And we know, because my newspaper, we wrote an article on it, basically the, uh, the, the main party, the government party, they consider this, this is a toxic uh, debate. So, in my opinion, probably uh, they will try to um, uh, be quiet about this, so stay low profile and wait that all this mess uh, goes away. Craig, a toxic debate for European politicians. I mean, other countries have been down this road. Some have hesitated how far they go even with an apology. Well, if you're going to look at the colonial crimes, why don't we update it and take a look at the African corruption now and the hundreds upon hundreds of billions of dollars that African dictators have, have looted from their people, often in cahoots with Western businessmen, certainly more recently with Putin's henchmen, Chinese mandarins. Uh, uh, there's, there, there's more than enough corruption to go around. And if, and if any authoritative body wanted to find evidence, the evidence you require for reparations, you're not going to find it in 16th century slave ledgers, most of which are probably lost at the bottom of the sea, but you're going to find it in financial transactions uh, since the 1940s and 50s to, uh, to until now, and the corruption that's been going on down there. But of course, no one wants to look at the modern corruption because too many people are getting rich off of it. But then wouldn't some, you know, waiting for some kind of compensation, if you had treasures looted, if you had massive wrongs in your family, the argument could be that's whatabautism. That is a sense of a new crime 
replacing the old crime. Well, I want my Elgin marbles back right now. So Fair enough. Let's... There is a valid point to which the UK government appears to be in talks yeah. with the, the Greeks, but uh, nothing's happening. We're not getting them back, and that's your fault. Well, I, I blame Rishi Sunak. Um, <laughs> icicle. <laughs> We, talk, we talked a moment about, about this difficulty within Europe. The British king, Charles, recently went to former colonies. Very calibrated messaging. Our apology seems to be, we just heard the Portuguese president say, it's the easiest word, but it seems to come with an implicit sense that if there's apology, then money is owed. Just tell us your view on this. The thing that I find very interesting is that when we, when we look at who the Portuguese president is. You know, he comes from law. He was a professor of law. He was also a journalist. Um, so usually when you come with that uh, background, it's to no surprise that you try to look back to the past and try to bring some form of justice to the present. So there's that. There's what Susanna very rightfully said of being this charismatic man who wants to have the, conver sure. the conversation going. But also what is very interesting is that he will no longer be, um, be uh, eligible. So in Portugal, it's two terms, five years. He started his second term in 2021. He's leaving soon. And no matter how generous and grand you are as a leader, you really want to know that you're leaving behind you something that will live on when you are no longer at that throne. And I wonder if this is not one of the things that he wants to live behind him in the, in the sense of saying, let's open the conversation. And also, it's true what Craig said, we cannot go back that far, but to open that conversation here in Europe, which is kind of what Emmanuel Macron started as well uh, with, uh, with the Algerian past. This is what in the good old days of 15 years ago of what Recep Tayyip Erdogan started with the Armenian genocide right. conversation. So. It's, it's a continuation of this whole debate that, that is, if, even if there is no change, even if there is no reparation, the fact that we are now even talking about it, I think is a good sign. Well, with us also joining us, Paul Smith, uh, lecturer at the University of Nottingham, an expert in French uh, political life. Paul, good to have you on board the world this week tonight. I want to bring us on to what's going on in Gaza. 202 days of war since the Hamas massacres, the ripple effects of that, a Palestinian population trapped in the territory, <coughs> facing the risk of death by airstrikes and a battle to just get enough food to survive, leading to demonstrations taking place across Europe. Now, in the US, it's taken on a new dimension. This week, pro-Palestinian protests spreading across dozens of universities across the country. Let's have a look what's been going on. The elite Colum Columbia University in New York becoming a flashpoint, continuing for 10 days now. Hundreds of students camping on university lawns. Police called in, clearing an encampment in Texas too. State troopers becoming involved. These scenes we're seeing repeated here as well. At Insider uh, Paris, we're seeing at Science Po University similar protests for three days in a row. Let's get a sense of what's going on. First of all, I want to hear from President Biden this week. This is what he's had to say. I condemn the anti Semitic protests, that's why I've set up a program to deal with that. I also condemn those who don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. Fine. Yeah, you said Paul. Paul is. OK. Now, the White House later clarified that he reaffirmed people's rights to protests and address Palestinian suffering. But he said he condemns anti-Semitism and making Jewish students feel unsafe. Let me uh, bring in Isigal on this. What's your take on this week's events? So, f first of all, I'm not talking in the name of Sciences Po, where I teach. I'm talking in my own name. Let that be said. I'm not uh, someone from the administration in terms of leadership. Uh, second of all, Sciences Po is not the only university in Europe or in France. There's Sorbonne as well, where, there ha where, where we have seen this. What I want to do as, as a professor, as a teacher, is to, to I have students who are, you know, undergrad and grad, is, and Craig, who has also taught at the American University in Paris, knows very well, is that we are also raising civilians who are going to be conscientious of what's going on in the world. Um, for that, we have been um, battling in a way of saying that the youth today doesn't care about what's going on in the world, that they're spoiled brats, that all they want to be is be famous and rich. And then we criticize them when actually they are trying to be 
to say something to do to do, to the system and that they, they they disagree with it. So first of all, we have to be uh, you know we have to decide what we want from from this youth. Second of all, it is true that there are some um, some some wordings, some um, flags that we've seen at Columbia at Columbia University, at Harvard, that some uh, rhetoric about Hamas that's absolutely unacceptable from the voice of these, uh, of these youth. But I remember two schools today, USC and NYU, that I mentioned at the beginning of, of uh, the program that I attended. And 20 years ago, I was where they are uh, demonstrating against the war in Iraq, uh, where I said no more of that as well. So. In a way, we have to listen to them and to see this as a way for them to have their voices be heard, and especially in American universities, which are so costly. Mm. I think there's something to be said that, that the people want to know where their dollars and their tuitions are going <laughs> in, in, in finance. Well, you're right. No, you're, you're, look, you're right. But I, I, have, I have to quibble with something you said. I mean, I, I did not bring the survey with me. But the, the, the recent Harvard survey said that the uh, student, young people's interest in what's going on in the Middle East is at the very bottom of the list. Look, the problem with American universities, particularly the elite ones, they're like, you know, wonderful, wonderful, once noble breeds of dog, you know? And they've been so inbred over the years that they drool and they don't know what's going on anymore. They're completely out of touch. And this sickness is set in. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to show my age. You know, 50, 54 years ago next week, I was a freshman in college in Ohio covering the Kent State riots, the massacres, when four kids were killed at, at Kent State University. You can listen to the Neil Young song, Ohio. It's still very popular. And those protests against the war, without getting into fine-tuning and sounding like a baby boomer, there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets, hundreds of thousands in, in universities. All universities shut down. There were major marches. We don't see that now. And there's also a lot of what's now being called astroturfing. How many people are coming to these campuses who aren't students? But I share what you said, Asigal. You need to teach these students how to think and to have a discussion to weigh both sides. That's not going on on the campuses. I don't know why, but I think yeah. it's part of this inbreeding. That's that's what came Ray, out. Right, you can't. You don't know that. You're not on all campuses. We don't I, have you access to all, you from all of them. The Craig, let me let me cross in. Well, little bird of my ear told me a second ago we had Paul Smith, the expert from the University of Nottingham. In fact, we have good news. We have Patrick Smith back. Who we <laughs> promised at the beginning of the program, <laughs> editor in chief uh, of Africa Report in Ghana right now, just to bring us and bring you into this debate, Patrick. What are you seeing right now? We talked at the start of the program about echoes of 1968, which some analysts are saying, you know, these anti-Vietnam uh, protests going on that happened at the same month in April. There are links to Columbia University as well. How do you assess what's going on and whether this could be a national movement in the US? Yes, I, well, I think it's certainly got the germs of, of a global movement, actually. Um, and I do think the parallel with the, the war in Southeast Asia is worth taking into account um, because in at that point we saw the the u.s war against uh, communism in uh, initially in north vietnam of course it it spread in a secret war to cambodia and laos and did the most horrendous damage to those countries uh, under the nixon uh, presidency with uh, the late uh, henry kissinger recently late Henry Kissinger, as his advisor, running a secret uh, aerial bombardment campaign in, in, in Cambodia. Um, and I think people um, that I have spoken to across Africa, in particular, and in, in, in some parts of Europe, are drawing some sort of parallel with, with the, what's happening in plain sight uh, in, 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 in Gaza, that we have a situation where things are being defended, that is, uh, Israel's right of uh, self-defense in, in Gaza, in retaliation for the October 7th attacks, uh, and that's been compared with the American campaign against communism. What people are saying is that the difference this time is that you've got Russia's war in Ukraine 
happening at the same time, and people can compare the Western positions on that right at the same time, in real time. They're saying, well, Putin's been fighting and invading Ukraine. He, he's killed so far maybe 11,000, 12,000 civilians mm. in this war in Ukraine that's been going on for two, two years or more. Um, yet in short, uh, just over six months, the Israeli Defense Force have left 35,000 casualties, uh, deaths in, in, in Gaza. So I, I, I think uh, people are joining the dots and making those comparisons. And the West yeah. is being asked, yeah. you know, what about the double standards? And young people particularly are asking their governments in the US, but in Europe as well, why are you supplying arms? Why are you doing nothing to promote a ceasefire here? Because this is happening on our, uh, with our tax dollars and on our watch. It's interesting. Isagul, you're nodding your head. Craig, you're shaking your head. <laughs> Isagul, just tell me what your thoughts on this. You agree? Well, first of all, it's so nice to see Patrick Smith, um, <laughs> and I fully agree with what he, with what we uh, with what he said. But it's it, I don't know what else can I can I add. The, the thing is that that um, yes, this is not at the at the. Big, it's not the time of Leonard Cohen songs. This is not the time of the Vietnam War. This is not. I do agree, but is it but, time of it, but social media problem, awareness, rapid spread of information. But the problem that I have is that we live in a time right now with uh, the war uh, uh, in Gaza, uh, where professors and students are being fired from their schools because of tweets that they retweet mm -hmm. or because of they are trying to express what they 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 believe in, and this is where it's very shaky. It's not because we criticize a, a, a regime that it means that we are against the whole population of that regime. Nassigal's right. On, on that point, I agree with you 100%. There's absolutely no comparison to be made with what happened back in the 60s and early 70s uh, and what's going on now. None whatsoever. The demonstrations of that era were primarily dra anti-draft, anti-conscription demonstrations by wealthy white people and their families who <clears throat> didn't want their kids coming home in body bags. That's what it was about. Yes, there were people concerned about the rights of the Viet Cong and this, that, and the other thing. Kumbaya, peace, love, brown rice. Absolutely. But what put people on the streets was that American kids were going to die, and, 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 and that, that's what engendered that. Now, these ancillary issues that have grown out of the problems in the Middle East need to be discussed in a fulsome and a wholesome way on college campuses. Yeah. But I would argue that the majority of these elite schools are now bloody tone deaf as to the realities of what's going on in the world. Well, Craig and Isagul, you mentioned what brings us on quite nicely, actually, the age we're in, a very different age, an age of social media, because there have been two significant moments this week when it comes to regulation of mm -hmm. social media regarding how we as a global society deal with online risks and dangers. The first coming from the French president's keynote speech on Thursday, Emmanuel Macron speaking for over an hour on a range of issues ahead of the EU elections on the risks of social media to young people and a lack of moderation. He claimed that you should have an age minimum of 15 years old, he said, and a call for parental control on access for digital space under 15. Also this week, this man, Elon Musk, had a run-in with both the Australian and Brazilian governments. This is how... I think we're going to see Musk in a moment. This is how Anthony Albanese, the Australian Prime Minister, described Musk this week. This guy is showing his arrogance. He's a billionaire uh, over there in the United States who thinks he's above Australian law. And he's fighting for the right to show violent videos on his platform. Uh, something that can cause uh, damage to uh, young people, we know, and a great deal of distress, uh, something that will add to social division. The eSafety Commissioner has made a, a, a ruling. The other social media platforms all complied uh, without complaint. This isn't about censorship. It's about common sense and common decency. And Elon Musk should show some. The arrogant mm -hmm. billionaire. So this argument stems from Musk's refusal to take down graphic video of a church stabbing 10 days ago in Sydney on his Twitter X platform. Australia's online safety commissioner demanded it was taken down. Musk said it's a violation of 
free speech. So no, he did later remove it, but not at the time. At the heart of the issue here, he is saying that uh, we have censured the content now in question for Australia, pending legit appeal. It's only stored on service in the US. He also calls the Australian e-safety, quote, commissar. Um, Patrick, let's start with the Macron call for minimum age limit on the internet. Has he got a point? Well, you're certainly not going to get invited to Elon Musk's next birthday party. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think essentially, you know, with any new innovation in the world, you know, great, let's celebrate technology, but let's admit that we need regulation. That's why we have a driving license. We have a, you know, driving test. You test people's uh, proficiency before you put them in charge of a, of, a, of a deadly vehicle. The same thing with social media. I mean, you know, the, the Musk idea of a free market, you can come along and broadcast whatever killings you like, whatever incitements you like so for people to go out and kill. Um, that's for the birds. I mean, that, that would lead to complete anarchy. And the fact he's back down in yeah. the face of the Australian courts, you uh, know, is yeah. it, an indication of that. The Hobbesian state of the uh, state of nature kind of view. Susanna, is he a lone wolf in Europe on this issue? Or are there similar conversations at EU level, other European governments? Could this get traction in Lisbon, Madrid, Berlin? Uh, well, uh, I, I don't think he's a lone wolf, because, for instance, now in uh, Europe you have this uh, Digital Services Act, it's a uh, uh, DSA, as we call it here. So you have new rules for uh, big techs uh, and platforms are supposed to uh, comply with these new uh, obligations. You might say that these rules are not perfect, they are not uh, enough, but they, at least they are new, they are there. And the Commission uh, is already opening proceedings against TikTok, against Musk, under these uh, DSA new regulation. And, uh, for instance, this week, uh, we had the European uh, Commission uh, opening a second proceeding against a formal proceeding against uh, TikTok. The problem now is that uh, um, is this uh, TikTok little uh, that was launched in France and uh, Spain. Once again, the European Commission is uh, worried that um, actually TikTok did not. Uh, uh, do what it was, it was supposed to do uh, in order to mitigate risks. Um, the main concern um, is that this uh, new uh, program that they call uh, um, something like... Um, so the, the main problem is that they, they are worried that this uh, task uh, reward program uh, that was launched by TikTok yeah. is uh, really addic addictive for children. And actually the first uh, proceeding that that was also uh, launched uh, or opened uh, against TikTok in February was already uh, related to the specific uh, um, concern uh, regarding uh, children's protection and how they must be protected against all these uh, addictive uh, or addictive uh, uh, platforms and uh, games and uh, whatever. So yeah. uh, you see that the European Commission is at least trying to do to do something. I'm not sure if you're going to ask me about uh, Musk. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> that I'm asking you questions. Uh, but uh, it's interesting because the European Commission um, already had a first clash with Musk. Um, and we see uh, Thierry Breton, the French commissioner, uh, tweeting uh, yeah. or posting uh, on X uh, that uh, actually is, uh, the European Com Commission is uh, investigating uh, how uh, X is uh, behaving, what exactly they're doing to avoid illegal content. Susanna, we've got to uh, let you go because yeah. talking of TikTok, time is beating <laughs> us, but you're right. Uh, Musk taking on many governments right now. It's probably, maybe we look back at this as a wild west of the internet. Thank you this week, Isigal Cert, uh, also with Craig Copetas, um, Susanna Frex is, of course, in Brussels, and a late substitute Patrick Smith, Africa Report in Ghana. We'll be back in seven days for the world this week, next week.